Four, it's coming up fast. And after an overall week 2023, where two original movies thrived and all the sequels and remakes fizzled, Hollywood is back with sequels and prequels, basically. No remakes this year, uh, pretty much. Uh, but you know what? It takes Hollywood a little bit of time to, uh, to shift course. An established IP is still their safest bet. It has been for decades, but in 2023, some really big IP really flopped. So, whoo, yee, I, I'm sure Hollywood is, is very nervous. But it's not our money that's riding on it. But on that, on that note, let's place our, uh, our funny money bets, uh, you know, just for fun, on what will be the top 10 movies of summer 2024. I've got mine all lined up. I'm gonna share them with you right now. And I'll be curious to hear down below what you think will be the biggest hits of summer 2024. Uh, so the movie that I think will just make the top 10 movies of the summer is number 10, The Fall Guy. What, doesn't this movie have a ton of buzz? It does. But I think it has some, some very big problems baked in. At the bottom of this list, it's funny. This list is going to start off with me like poking holes in movies that look really good, uh, business holes. And then uh, with movies that maybe don't look f phenomenal, I'm going to show why they're too big to fail. So this is very much a business video. Love business. All right, so the fall guy. Universal certainly believes in this film. Even Steven Spielberg said it was great. Although I think we're over major Hollywood players telling us movies are great. But, uh, you know, when Deadpool and Wolverine had to abandon its May release date, kicking off the summer this year to retreat to July because of the strikes, in swooped Universal and said, the fall guy shall open the summer. They've even just premiered it at South by Southwest months in advance. You can buy tickets for The Fall Guy right now. Did you buy tickets? Uh, I actually picked up some tickets. You know, you know I, I might as well get the good seats. Although when you have an A-list reservation, it just occurred to me, I'm going to be sitting on that. It's going to be taking up part of my three movies a week for weeks. I wonder, I wonder if I'll end up letting those tickets go to make room for something else. That's, that's, that's quite the uh, conundrum. But yes, tickets are already on sale. Review, some reviews are out from those that are at South by Southwest. Lots of spoilers in them, too, which I was shocked by. And then the film is going to be shown again at CinemaCon in April. I hope it doesn't feel like old news by the time it finally hits the general public. But the movie does look amazing. It looks fantastic. Uh, and it's not only seeming to build on the buzz of Barbie with Ryan Gosling front and center doing like kind of like a little bit of a Ken routine again, but it even references Barbenheimer with Emily Blunt co-starring. They just laughed it up or yucked it up at the Oscars. All right, but here I come to poke some holes in it, too, in fact. All right, so outside of Barbie, Ryan Gosling has never been able to sell tickets. No matter what genre, nobody wants to see this guy. So, I mean, maybe he's finally broken through with Barbie, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't, uh, I don't think it's a safe bet. Let's just say that. I hope he does, but I don't know. And then here's an even bigger hole. General audiences have notoriously not been interested in movies or shows that go behind the scenes in Hollywood. No matter the quality, general audiences have missed out some incredible content over the years because they simply don't care about what makes Hollywood tick. So while uh, everybody who loves movies, and you know, who's in the industry or is a fan, gets a, a giggle out of this conversation, for the most part, people seem to not only not care, but to actively not care. So while The Fall Guy, I think, will definitely have its fans and might become a cult hit, I can see a lot of people waiting to watch it on digital or streaming, if at all, instead of heading to the multiplex. Which kind of makes the movie then, therefore, a meta-commentary on the, on, on the movie business uh, itself. So at least it'll have that going for it. All right, number nine, Horizon, an American Saga. Now, fascinatingly, or depressingly, depending how emotionally invested you are uh, in the artistic side of Hollywood, I love both sides. Remember, Hollywood's a perfect balance of business and creativity. But I've put the two largely original movies dead last on my list. The Fall Guy is technically based on that TV show that very few people remember. Uh, usually someone you know who's a little bit older might be like, that was a TV show. And you'll be like, oh, I don't care. Uh, and then also Kevin Costner, is, has been historically known for Westerns. So him making a new Western is kind of just like a Kevin Costner sequel. 
But yeah, this is why Hollywood is afraid of original ideas, because I think these two movies have the, the least chance of being boffo hits out of this group. All right, now Horizon is an impressive gamble. Costner's bid at creating his own avatar, a saga meant to be four parts with two coming out this very summer. That's right, instead of waiting the usual one to three years before sequels, he's doing them both in the very same summer. It's exciting. It's a fantastic experiment that's badly needed as theatrical tries to find new ways to compete with streaming. But here are the holes, here I come. I got three for this one. All right, so audiences, for the most part, haven't enjoyed Westerns since the 1960s. Although, to Kevin Costner's credit, when they have liked a Western, it's been a Kevin Costner Western, usually. Then, apparently, some Yellowstone fans are ticked off with Costner for abandoning the hit show and might not show up to support his new venture. I mean, I think he's gambling that he'll take them with him, but he might not. And then here's the big one. This, one to me, was very interesting. Now, the first trailer for Horizon, I liked it. I thought that it showed a nuanced, modern take on the West telling that story, drawing a clear parallel between those who moved West back in the past to those who are moving North today. Really, you know, really underscoring that it's the same kind of, of movement. So if you support one, how can you not support and understand the other? But that seems to have been too subtle because it seems that almost nobody picked up on that with social media instead focusing on the fact that the movie seems to depict settlers versus Native Americans as clear-cut good versus evil, which, of course, was not the case. It was, a, you know, a much more complex situation. And it's understandable that some people would be, mo many people would be turned off if that were the way the movie was going to depict the situation. I think Costner is doing a more sophisticated, better job, but his trailer did not get that across. It could be too late! People might have already written off the film. Um, and he has to do a balancing act because then there are some people who want the old fashioned message, I guess. You know, what's Costner's audience? Which is the bigger audience? Can he get both? You know, it's a, it's a, it's, it'll be interesting to see if he can pull it off. But, you know, he might, he might end up having a big, he, so he could have a big audience for this movie, a niche audience, or no audience. Oh, tough. That's why original ideas are scary. All right, uh, how do you feel about Horizon? Do you maybe now see that about the movie now that I pointed it out from the trailer? Uh, and again, if people didn't see it right away, that's the trailer's fault. It's Costner's fault. He's got to fix it if he can. All right, number eight, Furiosa. Now, before Dune, there was Mad Max. And Mad Max was a solid hit, and in fact, actually was never as successful as Dune. But back then, everybody was shocked that it made as much money as it did. And then it went on to win a handful of Oscars, pretty much the same Oscars that Dune would go on to win. Uh, and in fact, it created a type of category where a film is celebrated but can't get all the way to director and picture and actor and stuff like that. Well, kind of a little bit with actor, uh, because Poor Things was the latest installment like that, and Poor Things did manage to get Best, best Actress. Uh, it's kind of like the, the second tier celebrated movie of the Oscars that year. Not the big one, but the next one up that still gets its flowers. Uh, and Mad Max kind of created that pocket. Uh, George Miller said right away that he wanted to tell Furiosa's origin story. And we all had to get over the fact that he decided to, to go with a younger actress than poor Charlize Theron, who, of course, had helped him create the role. We'll see if, this, that, that, if, that, if that becomes an issue for this movie. Uh, it might have been so long, though, that it doesn't, because here we are, well, I'm not sure, here we are 10 years later. It took George Miller a little bit of time to get to this. Uh, that's why it's like, Denis, make Dune uh, Messiah now. Uh, but when the trailer did come out, a number of people were like, where's Charlize Theron? Uh, so, you know, it might, it, might, it might be an issue for the movie. Then the other thing is, is Mad Max still a thing, especially now that we have Dune? Aren't we all into Dune now? Are people going to want to go back to, you know, the beginnings of the, of the trend? Uh, and then also, neither Anya Taylor-Joy nor Chris Hemsworth have proven to be box office draws. It can always change, though. Suddenly, Timmy C is a big star. And beforehand, he couldn't bring anybody in. Uh, and although, also, and also... Um, this, so it might be Anya Taylor-Joy and Chris Hemsworth's time, finally. And then Miller does know how to throw a party. If you remember Mad Max Fury Road, it was incredible. It was just an incredible work of art. So if this movie is as good as the last one and fires on the same cylinders, it could at least benefit from premium screens and maybe repeat business that will keep its box office 
above Ryan Gosling and Kevin Costner. It's still just number eight on this list. I still only think it's going to get that high. So it, even if it doesn't get to the heights of Dune, even if it only makes a little under $400 million like the last Mad Max, I still think that would maybe put it in a better position than Fall Guy and Horizon. So it's, it's, got, it's got that going for it. But basically, when it comes to not only the box office, but probably next year's Oscars, Dune is drinking Mad Max's Sandy Milkshake. I mean, at least it's both Warner Brothers. I don't, I don't know why they would do that to themselves. Uh, but I guess, you know, if one movie fizzles, nobody, they don't have to feel too bad about it. It is bizarre. You know, it's weird. I don't know, I don't know if Furiosa or, or the Mad Max franchise in Dune really should be in the same year. What do you think? Uh, I guess because it wasn't supposed to be. It was the, uh, the the actor strike that created this scenario. But Dune greatly benefited from it. But it might really just really um, you know heart uh, you know slash the chances for Furiosa. All right, number seven, Craven the Hunter. Oh, what the heck? That's right. I actually put this not dead last after Morbius and Madam Web. What am I thinking? Well, here, I'm, I'm telling you, I'm starting to, now I'm starting to tell you that there are some business reasons that defy maybe the creative aspects, right? We're starting to, we're starting to switch in the other direction. All right, so again, two reasons. One, I think the Sony Spider-Man-less movie is going to take after Venom. Hot guy, lots of violence and jokes, rated R, remember, and a 90s vibe. And both Venom movies made tons of money, even though the second one sucked. It still made a ton of money. They're making a third Venom. Venom is the reason that all these other crappy Spider-Man-less movies exist. So there's something here. Then two, what a release date. Ah, Labor Day weekend. Beautiful. We've been saying, why don't more people utilize Labor Day weekend? Why don't more studios labor uh, utilize this release date? Especially after Sean Chi did incredible business here. Uh, really creating this as a, you know, nobody used to want to open on Labor Day weekend because the idea was everybody wanted to party outside, you know, for the last uh, weekend of the summer. But it seems it's a couple of days and maybe you might actually want to go to a movie after all. Sean Chi proved that that's the, that could be the case. And then Equalizer 3 just recently took this date and did very well there. It's a, it's a strong weekend. And so kudos to Sony for taking it for Craven. Uh, I think Sony has given Craven the best possible chance of, of being a success, and it could turn into a guilty pleasure. Uh, and Aaron Taylor Johnson maybe finally could get his movie star on. I mean, it could be another Morbius and Madam Web, but I, 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 think there's, I think there's a genuine chance here. All right, number six, Alien Romulus. You know, Hollywood just doesn't give up, especially when it comes to IP. And here comes Alien back again. We're going to try this yet again. But the clever move here is bringing in Fetty Alvarez, who sure is hit or miss, but he's got that kind of weird, creative, no-holds-barred vibe that could really benefit this franchise. In fact, word has already gotten out, gotten out, the studio put it out there because they're hyping up the movie, and the casts, uh, a very CW cast, but it's also maybe a very slasher cast, or a slasher movie cast, if we want to put a positive spin on it, but they've said, ah, oh, Fetty showed us some of the footage and it's so disgusting we couldn't even watch it. Now that's cool, that makes for a great headline, but it's a tricky balancing act. You want to be gross enough to make headlines and throw down the gauntlet to moviegoers being like, can you handle it? But if you're just too gross and you look too gross from the trailers alone, you might limit your audience. Some people might be like, I'm tapping out now, man. I know I'm not going to be able to take it. You know, I'm squeamish. I mean, I, I'm going to review it, so I'll definitely watch it. But, you know, if I weren't reviewing it, would I maybe tap out? What's, what's your, where do you tap out on this stuff? Uh, if Alvarez can strike just the right balance, he could make solid, if not significant, box office with another sweet release date for him mid-August. August is perfect for this type of movie very well positioned. Although, another movie that came out in mid-August that everybody had high hopes for was Shane Black's The Predator. And that ended up being just awful. And putting that, putting that franchise back into hibernation for a little bit until it had to eventually be uh, reinvigorated by Dan Trachtenberg. Although he got it back on track. So here's hoping Alvarez is a Trachtenberg and not a, a, a Shane Black. 
All right, number five, A Quiet Place, day one. These movies have been fantastic. Not only are they uniquely entertaining, it's so fun with everyone having to be quiet in the theater because, you know, uh, the movie's quiet. It, it, you, don't, you wouldn't think it would work for more than one movie, but I think it has so far. But also, they're very cheap. These are, well, this one, this one raises the bar, so it's not going to be as cheap as the last two, but they're certainly cheap compared to other blockbusters. And just when you thought the story didn't have any place left to go, they do a full-on origin story, which brings in more of a disaster film element. Ah, people love those. I love them. And that means more destruction, more aliens, more action. Yeah, a little bit more expensive, but hopefully, you know, the upping the ante will be reflected in the box office and make the extra expense worth it. Plus, John Krasinski transitioning to solely producing now. He also helped come up with the story. But he made sure his franchise kept its pedigree, this time bringing in Oscar winner, winner Lupita Nyong'o, who did very, you know, she hasn't really established herself as a draw, but she has been in very big hits. Not only the two Black Panther films, where she wasn't the star, but was a big part of it, but then also Jordan Peele's Us. Not as big as we would have liked, but I think people, you know, even though the movie kind of fell apart at the end, I think when we look back at it, we have, we, we look back at that movie fondly. Certainly, Lupita Nyong'o's performance. So that's good. Then also, Stranger Things rising star Joseph Quinn, who's on the eve of Gladiator 2 and Fantastic Four. Everybody wants to get a look at this guy. And here's your chance. It's also kind of a similar dynamic to Emily Blunt and John Krasinski when you think about it, right? Oscar celeb or nominated Oscar celebrated actress and like TV star, you know, a lovable, you know, TV lead. Oh, that's pretty interesting. They tried. To, I think they. I think they. That's interesting. They repeated it that way. Also, they were very flirty at the Oscars. Are they dating? I'm a little behind on my celebrity gossip. All right. So then there's a new director writer Michael uh, Sarnowski, who cinephiles have been raving about ever since his debut with Pig, starring Nicolas Cage. Hardly any. Hardly anyone saw that movie. I'm sure someone down below is like, I saw Christ. It was brilliant. Awesome. You were responsible for getting Michael Sarnowski this gig. So the question, though, is, is that uh, does he really have the goods, right? If he does, this movie could explode, opening, talk about another good release date, opening right before the 4th of July frame. All right, number four, Twisters, from prequel to sequel. Every, sometimes people think Twisters is like a remake, because Twister was so long ago. But this is technically a sequel. Uh, but here's, okay, so, so it does have an interesting cast, Glenn Powell, he finally is the lead in a big blockbuster, but it's going to be time to see whether or not he can be a star. This is it. Up until now, everyone's like, Glenn Powell could be a movie star. Well, now we're going to find out for sure. And then the new Superman is in here too, but luckily he's not the star, so not as much as riding on it for him. Although Anthony Ramos, I'm glad he got another chance, but this is like, this could be his third strike and he's out because he really needs a hit after In the Heights and Transformers both failed to connect. Uh, I love Anthony Ramos. I hope this works out for him. However, who cares about the, the cast? Because Twisters is cast proof. In other words, it doesn't matter who's in the movie because the star is the Twisters themselves and the trailer is already promising wall-to-wall -wall doozies. Plus, crisscrossing the American heartland with clear blue skies until they aren't? That's a ride right there, baby. In fact, Twister has been a ride at Universal Studios for a very long time. It's really built into a lot of our consciousnesses. So I think that people are going to feel that this is a great theatrical experience, especially for the summer. I mean, come on. Kick back at the movie theater with a popcorn and fuzzy soda and watch Twisters? It sounds like a date. Number three, Despicable Me 4. I know. How does this franchise keep doing so well? I mean, in the beginning, I think we all understood it because the first few movies were fantastic. I've loved the Despicable Me movies and the Minion spin-offs all the way through the first Minion. So I've, the first three movies, I thought they were fantastic. But the last two, I mean, it was shock, shocking, shockingly like lazy and on autopilot. But hey, when your movie, when your franchise is cranking out a billion or, or about a, 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 an entry, I mean, how can you how can you fault the creatives? You just you just kind of don't want to touch it. You're like, let's just not fiddle with it until it stops making around a billion. And so far, we haven't reached that point. Uh, now, sure, the last I mean, they're so European. I think that's one of the reasons that Illumination does so well. I think they have a very strong global appeal, and it's something that Hollywood usually doesn't do. I do think that's the secret ingredient when it comes to all of Illumination movies, but particularly. 
um, this this particular franchise that actually started off the uh, illumination in the beginning. What do you think is the trick to why Despicable Me movies continue to do so well? All right, now one thing is the last one kind of cheated, uh, although a lot of uh, pr uh, movies and products are doing this these days, and then it benefited immensely from a social media craze. Now, often the company will claim that they just are the beneficiary of some amazing, amazing thing that just came about on the internet, but a lot of the times they actually manufactured it themselves. But hey, it works, it works. They're getting very good at making something seem organic that is not. Uh, and then it just takes on a life of its own. It's fun. It's, it's really interesting to plant that seed and to see how it can grow. Now, of course, this was no Barbenheimer, but it was impressive. It was very impressive, in fact. You know, maybe they got the idea for Barbenheimer from this. Uh, it really created a craze that didn't have the legs of Barbenheimer, but it, it was big enough that Universal was able to scoop up their money and run. And maybe something else will come along, you know, come along, be created, that could blow up Despicable Me 4 and make it seem like more than just a ripoff of The Incredibles, Gru style. I feel it's a ripoff of The Incredibles, and as a huge fan of The Incredibles, I'm a scooch insulted. But I, I don't know. I mean, who's not going to go and see the latest Despicable Me movie? I think a lot of you might... I think a lot of you would go at the end of the day. I mean, Universal has a lot invested in this franchise, not just the movies, but now the theme parks, and of course all the merch. We're all invested. Uh, this brand is a part of our lives. And so I think that we like just like being in this world. So at the end of the day, that's probably why we keep going to see the movies. Banana? Yes, please. Another billion or close likely incoming. All right, now, hilariously, for all the recent drama hate and prophesizing of doom, it looks like Disney is going to have the two biggest movies of the summer. I know, I know, it's hilarious. Bob Iger's like, yes. All right, so number two, Inside Out. Some franchises and or brands have just become tradition. As I said, just like Despicable Me. And when it comes to the Pixar classics, they're likely, likely, because there's always a slim chance. Because uh, look what happened to Lightyear, although that was, they should have known better. Uh, but, you know, they're like, you know, if you're close enough to the original formula, they're probably too big to fail. That was Lightyear's mistake. Too different from what people wanted. The first Inside Out was a monster hit way back in 2015. And now, just like everyone keeps coming out for the Toy Story movies, no matter how much they complain, you're gonna come out and want to, you're gonna come out and meet these new emotions. I didn't even like the first Inside Out, and I'm excited about this. I mean, come on, how are you not gonna go? I mean, maybe the sequel won't be as good. What does it matter? Finding Dory, which stunk, still made a billion dollars. And I mean, I don't know. I guess you might say, well, people are learning and people are, you know, aren't going to be tricked. But really? I mean, you all went to see Toy Story 4. All right, and they're making another Toy Story. And you're probably all going to go and see that. Everyone on the face of the earth will see Inside Out 2 at least once. At least. It's just a cultural contract at this point, which is why Hollywood loves sequels. You know? I mean... It's, I, don't, I mean, it's going to be hard to kill them, but they're doing a pretty, they're getting pretty close. Let's see. 2023 was very scary. All right. What would it take for you not to see Inside Out 2? I'm genuinely curious. All right. And that's right. Number one. Was there any question? Deadpool and Wolverine. Has it, but wait a minute. Hasn't everyone lost faith in Marvel? Hasn't superhero fatigue set in? Isn't everyone upset with Disney? Well, that's why this movie is perfectly positioned. Oh my goodness, he is Marvel Jesus. It's been a long time since we last saw Deadpool or Wolverine. And it was back, when was it? Back when everyone still loved comic book movies. So it kind of gives you the hope that this duo can bring us back to the good times. Also, they're fan favorites. And how can you resist not only them coming back, but teaming up? And they're so fun in real life. I mean, it's just a party. Plus, Ryan Reynolds is a unique, independent, creative voice who's proven himself, which is, which is why not only do audiences love him, but, but why Disney and Kevin Feige have given him free reign to play with all of our favorite toys and voice all of our frustrations with the current situation. So that means that Deadpool and Wolverine won't just be fun, but it'll be cathartic if all goes to plan. I love that. that sh they should put on the poster. Plus, bottom line, the Fox Marvel movies are iconic, even when they stunk. It's, it was in an iconic way. I mean, they are a part of the, at this point, they are a part of pop culture history. And to revisit that era 
will likely be a nostalgia trip that few can turn down, especially because Ryan Reynolds promises to keep it real. He'll call out the crap, but he'll also celebrate what was good and give some of these actors the chance to take their characters out on top. I mean, there are a lot of actors who we felt got the short end of the stick when it came to the Fox Marvel movies. We would love to see them get a chance to shine at least once. This also is the Fox version of Sony's No Way Home. And that movie, even though almost everything in it leaked in advance, still managed, and it was only, I think, to some degree, I don't know, it depends if you love that stuff. To me, this is my uh, No Way Home. So I'm like, I just gotta be there. And there, you know, there are a lot of Spider-Man fans, but there are a lot of Fox Marvel fans. And that made, movie made almost $2 billion without China and coming out of the pandemic still. So I think that's pretty good. Also, rumor has it that this movie will lead into Secret Wars. They even featured the Secret Wars comic in the first teaser trailer. That's the next big Avengers saga. I mean, maybe it's one movie off, but probably not. But it's coming up. It's coming up. So will the MCU not only finally get back on track, but refocus? I think the odds are good that it'll get back to all that and also back to printing money. Very, very strong odds for this film. So, these are the movies that I think will be the most successful this summer. What do you think? I think we can all agree on number one, but we might differ with some of the runner-ups. I'll be curious to hear what you think are some of the business holes that you would poke into some of this stuff, and then also what are some of the business glow-ups, despite the creative. All right, share your thoughts down below. Subscribe today. At the very least, it's going to be a fun summer. Subscribe today, and of course, as always, you can check out some more videos right now.